Hi, this is Kaden from VIA Value Investing Academy. Now, welcome to VIA's very first episode for the hot topic of the month titled A Deep Dive into the Chinese Regulatory Storm. So before we go into the agenda, right, now uh, I just want to check if through my handphone, right, I could see the YouTube live and then there are about 92 people watching this video. If you do not mind, uh, uh, if any one of you are our graduate, since we are doing this for the very first time on YouTube, you know usually we do via Zoom, Facebook Live, and we are doing this for the very first time. If you do not mind, can you support us, right, by typing Huala in the YouTube video if you don't mind? I give you like 10 years to do it. Come, do me a favor. Okay, I read out your name, right? Oh, you know, we have Roger, we have Kuo Wei, we have Jocelyn, we have Dennis. Uh, just type Huala. Yeah, well, while you're figuring out how to type what, uh, if you don't mind, can you just click like on that YouTube video? Yeah, so that we, we can have more than 10 likes. <laughs> Usually our YouTube videos are, you know, like 5 likes, 10 likes, a bit pathetic, right? Yeah, so if you don't mind, can you just click on like and then type what? Uh? Okay, very good. Oh, so for, for the very first time, our YouTube live have, well, Kara is what? Uh, 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 there's an echo, right? <laughs> okay, thanks. So remember, right, click like, and then if there's a subscribe button, just do us a favor, just click the subscribe button. Okay, good. So let's get started. Now let me share with you what's the agenda for this evening. Yeah, by the end of this evening, you will learn really, really fascinating things. Huh? So let me share with you uh, what are the topics that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I'm done with my introduction. Huh? My introduction is simply to ask you to press subscribe and then click like. That's it. That's the best, shortest introduction ever. And then subsequently, I'm going to hand over to our new team member. Her name is called Raina, a wonderful and very smart lady. Uh, she will be the one that really <laughs> do all the heavy work and she'll talk about the topic that uh, we're going to discuss tonight, which is the deep dive into the Chinese regulatory storm. And then subsequently, she will hand over to me where I'll talk about what are the key learning lessons as a retail investor, especially for those that uh, you're looking at me right now, right? If you're holding some... China stocks that are listed in US, right? You have to pay attention to all these learning lessons. And then we go for a short toilet break, maybe about 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, when we are back, we will use the company called Alibaba Holding as an illustration to explain uh, about uh, who Alibaba is, what Alibaba is, and then with the current uh, Chinese clampdown, right, on the edutech company, how does it affect Alibaba? And of course, uh, if our graduate, uh, the most exciting thing you want to pay attention to the end, right, is the valuation of Alibaba. And then with that, then we will close statement and all of us can have a good rest already. Okay, so without further ado, uh, uh, I'm going to hand over, right, yeah, to our new team, team member, Reina, where she will really go deep dive into the Chinese regulatory system. So, Reina, over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kaden, for the kind words. Uh, my name is Reina Sanghai, and uh, so let's take a deep dive into the Chinese regulatory storm. So, let me start with giving you a refresher on what's happening in the regulatory crackdown. It all began with Jack Ma criticizing state-owned banks in a public forum, after which the regulator suspended Ant Group's IPO, uh, which, uh, which made the company lose $70 billion in revenue. They required Ali, uh, the Ant Group to restructure as a financial holding company. Next, an anti-monopoly probe was also launched against Alibaba, and a fine of $2.8 billion was imposed on it uh, because Alibaba was preventing its merchants from advertising its products on uh, competing platforms. And after this, uh, at least 34 other companies also came under the scanner of the regulators. They were given warnings to self-rectify and they were fined for various kinds of antitrust breaches. So next we have Didi, which is a ride-hailing company. It is like the Uber of China. So Didi decided to go public despite pushback from the authorities. This attracted severe reactions from the authorities. A, a review was launched and a task force comprising of officials from seven, uh, seven Chinese regulatory authorities carried out cybersecurity sweeps at Didi. 
This task force also included officials from National Security and Public Security Ministries of China. And new user registrations were also suspended. And DD's apps were also removed from the app stores. So continuing with the crackdown, the regulator focused on food delivery platforms like MyTuan. They issued new rules for the protection of the interests and rights of the drivers on these food delivery platforms. This was a major hurdle for MyTuan because it was already facing antitrust probes. Another hurdle was faced by Tencent. Tencent had made plans to merge China's uh, two video game uh, streaming companies, which were Huya and Douyu. This was blocked by the regulators on antitrust grounds. If that wasn't enough, uh, Tencent was also ordered to relinquish their exclusive music rights. And next, we come to the biggest damage which was suffered by the $100 billion plus edtech sector in China. The reformed rules required the following. All institutions offering tutoring on the school curriculum were to be registered as non-profit organizations. No new licenses would be granted to edtech uh, companies and they will no longer be able to raise capital abroad. Further, classes on weekends and holidays would also be banned. This caused a major blow to China's edtech industry. And as a result of that, the sector tumbled more than 90% in just a few days. So you must be wondering, what could be the reasons behind China hurting its own companies? Mainly, what they want to do is curb monopolistic practices. They want to ensure that the data of its people is secure. And they want to keep a check on capitalist excess. By keeping the big tech giants like Alibaba, Tencent, etc. in check, the CCP wants to loosen their grip on daily lives of the people in China by penalizing the anti-competitive and anti-trust practices and protecting the personal information of its users. So now let me discuss with you the reasons for the uh, suspension of the Ant Group IPO. Now, regulatory intervention was justified in the case of Ant Group because the business model of the company posed risk to moral hazards a uh, conflict of interest, and also predatory lending. Let me give you a brief background uh, about the business model of Ant Group here. So Ant Group started as a fintech company, but it soon grew into a big company which uh, in its segment also included credit. So a borrower may approach Ant, and then they will check the credit worthiness of this borrower through their opaque uh, proprietary AI system. So then the borrower gets the loan from Ant Group, but it's not actually getting the loan from Ant Group. It's uh, getting the loan from the partner banks, which are partnering with, with Ant Group. And the, the risk of the loan is borne by the partner banks. And the interest is also earned by the pa partner banks. Um, and Ant receives a service fee from these partner banks in return for the service. So you see, Ant doesn't have any risk on its balance sheet. But think about these partner banks. They didn't actually perform any checks uh, on the background of these borrowers. And Ant does not have a lot of incentive to make sure that they are good loans. So if the borrowers default, the partner banks lose money, not Ant. So does this model sound familiar to you? It is similar to the originate to distribute model uh, which was uh, which previously caused the 2008 subprime mortgage uh, crisis in the US. So the Chinese authorities suspected the risk of a financial crisis if Ant was allowed to list with their current business model. They prescribed Ant to be restructured as a financial holding company so that banking regulations could be applied to it. Um, and Initially, uh, Ant Group was functioning as a banking company, but the banking regulations were not applicable to it. So that is why the Chinese authorities suspended the IPO of Ant Group. Now let's move on to the reasons for the anti-monopoly probe. 
So the CCP wants to curb disorderly expansion of capital so that no one company becomes too powerful. It also wants to ensure that there, was, that there is fairness, equity, and efficiency in the market. So this is why several of the previous mentioned steps were taken by the government. Um, for example, Alibaba was fined because it abused its dominant position in the market because it forbade its merchants from advertising on rival sites. And then the merger of Huya and Douyu were also blocked because it would, would have given Tencent a majority control over the combined entity. These steps will encourage healthy competition in the economy. It will also be beneficial for the consumers and it will also benefit the small players who are uh, always intimidated by the big giants. Now let's discuss data security as a reason. So a major threat which was worrying Chinese regulators was that digital platforms like Didi or WeChat, they collect a lot of personal information from its users, for example, the location, travel history, whereabouts, or facial recognition, all of this. So the, the gigantic treasure trove of data causes an enormous privacy risk as well as a national security risk. And a similar risk exists with foreign IPOs as well, because uh, they may abuse or manipulate the data that, may, that they may get uh, from uh, the IPOs. And this is the reason why the Chinese government wanted to delay the IPO of DD, uh, but DD went ahead anyway and faced repercussions. Now let's discuss how, the, uh, how China is prioritizing its social, public, and state priori uh, interests over its investor interests. So food delivery platforms like Maituan have been criticized in recent months over the treatment of workers. Uh, the issues range from low pay to a lack of rights and uh, a lot of other issues. So the new reforms have been introduced to protect the interest of these employees in these food delivery platforms. And these include workers' income above minimum pay, relaxed delivery time limits, reasonable order volumes, and abiding by traffic rules by the rule, uh, drivers. The next uh, priority in the social reforms for the government was the edtech industry. The education culture in China is characterized by heavy competition, so that the children want to excel uh, and get into the best schools possible. It creates a lot of pressure on the child as well as the parents who want to provide the best facilities for their children to excel in the race. The edtech sector exploited this culture and it drove up the prices for providing various kinds of tutoring services. This translated to a huge cost burden on the parents, and it also increased the gap between the affluent and the low-income groups, because only the people with resources would be able to access some of these services, which would give an edge to their children. Also, the population growth in China is slowing down. The two-child policy cap has been increased to three, but a high education cost may act as a disincentive for parents to have more children. So the CCP does not want that. So the latest reforms have electrocuted the edtech industry, but through its socialist reforms, uh, China aims to remove unequal education access. It wants to reduce the stress on its children, and it wants to also reduce the cost burden on parents. This may be crippling for the edtech sector for the short term, but it definitely uh, will be beneficial for the long-term development of the economy. So you may ask, what is next? This clampdown could certainly slow down the growth and innovation in some sectors in China, uh, but the government remains supportive of public listings overseas. This is because it would let them increase their influence worldwide. Also, the five-year plan of the CCP includes focus on advanced technology sectors 
like AI, 5G, robotics, uh, and so on. And they want to utilize the growth in these sectors to become the next global superpower to displace USA. So, although the current clampdown has wiped out around $1.5 trillion from the technology stocks, the government is in a cleanup phase. And the next target is likely to be housing and medical sectors because prices in these sectors is also soaring. These are, however, short-term costs, which are expected to result in long-term gains. So, what does it mean for investors? The $2.8 billion fine has ended the regulatory overhang on Alibaba. This proves that the authorities merely want change and not a disruption. It doesn't want to destroy the wheels that drive the economy. For the edtech sector, the companies may focus on non-academic tutoring uh, avenues like computer coding, music, art, or others to remain relevant in the Chinese economy. The investor can take solace in the very likely possibility that the tech giants like Tencent, Meituan, etc., if they pledge to comply with the regulations and rules of the government uh, and they rectify their business practices, then they should turn out fine in the long term. So we all know that China is the second largest world power uh, in, in the world right now, and they are going to continue to innovate and grow. So it is not possible to have a truly global portfolio without having China in it. So the best bet for the investors could be to invest in sectors which have the support, the regulatory and subsidy support of the government, uh, which I have already mentioned earlier, like 5G, AI, robotics, and other advanced technologies. So now, in conclusion, I would like to mention that in the short term, there is uncertainty regarding the actions that the regulatory body in China may take. They are returning to a people-centric approach rather than a capital-centric approach. And no one doubts the long-term growth story of China. Giants like Tencent and Alibaba are important wheels to drive the Chinese economy. And as long as these companies play with the Chinese rules, they should be fine. Further, the CCP's ambition of making China a superpower should drive growth. And it should also deter them from taking any harsh actions which may cripple the long-term growth story of China. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. I now request Kaden to continue further with this presentation. Hi, uh, I'm back. Uh, just now you've read, uh, heard from Raina some of the reasons why the government actually start to regulate certain uh, industries uh, for various reasons. And if I could go back to the slide that Raina have, has shown, right? Uh, she has said that despite gloomy uncertainty, I think the long-term story for China uh, should, should be intact. I think this is something that, that I agree. And it's quite difficult for any retail investor to see that suddenly, right, maybe in a couple of months or one year, right, Tencent and Alibaba get, get uh, totally wiped off from the surface of the earth. I, I think I find that uh, quite difficult to imagine. It's like, it's like one day, right, suddenly McDonald's and Starbucks uh, went missing. I think it's quite difficult. Uh, but of course, moving forward, uh, right now, at least we understand the intention why the China government do certain things. Yeah, so, so you know, like, like a typical, uh, how should I say, right? Um, if you watch certain shows in the early days, uh, like for example, the emperor allowed the generals to do certain things. Yeah, I know you can do A to B to C to D, right? But do not cross the line. So as long as you don't cross the line, you align with what a CCP is thinking, right? Or, or one for the citizens. Uh, so I suppose Tencent and Alibaba uh, will be fine. But again, to give more specific uh, what it means to the, uh, any investors, right? For example, uh, for example, let's say you and me, if we, are, if we have invested in some China companies that are listed in US, right? So what are the things that we need to look out for? Now, th there are only two possibilities. The first possibility is right now, some of you are already holding the China stocks. Yeah, and then the share price plunge, and then you panic, and then you ask, you know, what should I do? So that's one a possible group of people. Now, the second possible group of people are those people who, who do not have any China stock yet, 
and then they are just sitting on a fence whether should they buy or, or so, you know, right now buy on the dip or whatsoever. So, but before you do anything, right, whether you buy or sell, maybe let, let me just list out some of the things you need to okay, move forward, huh? move forward, right? Now, the first thing is if you are great, right, uh, whatever that I'm, that I'm going to share with you, it's like, it's like a mom trying to nag at the children, hey, I already told you this one, two, three, can you please do this one, two, three? So, just pardon me, right? Uh, I may be saying something that you already know. But knowing is one thing, and then you do despite that you know, that's a separate thing. And I still remember many years ago when I met uh, Mary Buffett for the very first time. I think Mary Buffett is one of the uh, famous author, right, who wrote a series of books based on Buffettology. She once said that the best way to get out of trouble is to stay out of trouble. Yeah, the best way to get out of trouble is to stay out of trouble. Which brings us to point number one, right? Uh, you know, Warren Buffett has always said, if we want to invest in anything, especially stocks, uh, we must invest in something that is within our circle of competence. So what does he mean, right? What he's trying to say is, if I draw a circle, right? Draw a circle. Any companies that you're competent, you are not only competent, not only you, you fully understand, you have some form of competitive edge. In other words, you know more than a anyone that's walking along the street. Uh, then you are competent. So this competent is within the circle. So circle of competence. Now, a, when you're competent in something, you're very good in something, right? Then, obviously, the risk uh, will be much lower and your return will be much higher. Now, versus that if you're, versus if you're putting your hard-earned money into something that you have no idea what's going on. For example, for those people who are watching this video, right? If I ask you, uh, <laughs> have you bought Alibaba? And in case you raise your hand uh, and then ask you, do you know what Alibaba is, is doing? And then your answer is, you don't know. Ha <laughs> ha, good for you then you're buying something that's outside the circle of competence. That means you're, you're so-called not familiar, right? If you're not familiar, obviously you'll panic, right? <laughs> panic. But, but it's too late, really. Huh? It's too late, really, huh? So remember, uh, you, you always want to buy something that you fully understand. So, so that's point number one. Now, the second thing is in case you are you're holding on to Alibaba with your dear life, right? Like, like who? Like Dennis was saying, uh, hold on <laughs> for dear life. And then he <laughs> Then I think the one consolation is you have to ask yourself whether is Alibaba or any China company uh, that you're buying, are they a good business? And if you are a VA grad, you will know the VA funnel and you check off all those things uh, to double confirm that whether it's a good business. Now, if the company is a good, good business, you, you should be able to sleep soundly. But, but if you speculate, you buy Alibaba, Momo or whatever company is right, and then you're just uh, short-term gain, you know, guessing share price, then then uh, I think it's right that you worry. Huh? So number one, you better be familiar with what we're doing. Second thing, if you're holding on to some China stocks, uh, double check right whether it's a good business or a bad business. And of course, uh, we want the company uh, to be undervalued or at least uh, fair value. Fair value. Yeah. And Warren Buffett has once said, uh, I would prefer to buy a wonderful company uh, at a fair price right, versus uh, uh, a fair company at an undervalued price. So in short, he wants to buy a good company, which is stated in point number two. And point number four, right, is even if you buy a good company, you buy undervalue, right, make sure there's some form of buffer error because if you buy into the story of Tencent and then uh, Alibaba where they have a very exciting growth story, right, uh, then before you buy, you better have a buffer error. And of course, this is called the margin of safety. Yeah. So what did Ali say? Ali say Alibaba has 40 thieves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe some of you are the thieves, right? Or, or Jack Ma is the thieves. Okay. Anyway, point number five. Huh? Now, remember only to use spare cash to invest. Now, this may seem like a very simple uh, a, a, a advice, right? Uh, but just to share with you, we have just completed one batch of a value investing program over the weekend. And, and I remember there's this lady uh, who's quite young. I think she's probably in her 30s. She was asking me, right, whether uh, should I... Uh, borrow money to, to invest. Uh, so I, I think uh, better not. Okay, only use spare cash to invest because if you borrow, number one, one thing is sure is you have to pay the interest. And the second thing is you're unsure whether the market will collapse the next day. So in other words, if you borrow money, you pay interest and the market collapses the next day and it takes one year to recover. So in other words, not only you're not making uh, money, right? You may be sitting on, on some paper loss uh, while you have to pay interest. So with that kind of uh, anxiety, right? You may do silly things, uh, like, like such as cutting loss and so on. So these are five uh, simple lessons for us to know. But of course, there are more, right? Let me just share with you point number six and point number seven together. 
So the key thing is, remember, uh, during our four days value investing program, we talked about the SEGA, right? Where A stands for asset uh, portfolio. And I still remember, I spe uh, specifically say, you know, please draw a circle and then one part is cash, right? Remember? And then another part is ETF. And of course, the last one is stock. Yeah, and I mentioned that for the stock part, you know, you, you have some form of guideline where in each company, right, preferably in each industry, uh, make sure that it doesn't exceed uh, 10%. Yeah, 10%, right? So, for example, if you really allocate properly yeah, to mitigate the risk, right? This, this is how it may look like. So, for example, you may diversify by sector. Yeah, you may diversify by uh, where the company is being operating. So, for example, China will be here. Alibaba, obviously, is here. Yeah. Then, if you buy China companies, uh, this is not to scale, right? Obviously, here, you, you don't want to like 30, you, you don't want to have this uh, like 30%. Yeah. So, 10%, I think, yeah, it will be something that's worth uh, considering. So 10%. Huh? And if you diversify by sector, so again, technology may sound exciting, but you have to ask yourself, uh, even though in the technology sector, it appears to be fast growth, uh, usually it comes with a high risk. High risk. So you be very careful. Huh? So whether is it by sector or whether is it by geographical location, right? Uh, preferably you stick to a 10% as a rule of thumb. Okay, so that's point, point number seven, right? seven, right? So originally after uh, my segment, uh, actually, we are supposed to go for a tea break, which is why if you look at this picture here, there is a cup, right? There's a cup with coffee. But I realized that we are ahead of time. Ahead of time, huh? Yeah, so maybe we just proceed, right? We just proceed, huh? Yeah, so Raina is nodding. Hey, yeah, 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 let, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it, huh? So let me share with you what's going to happen, right? In the next maybe 20 minutes uh, or so, depending on the detail that uh, Raina is going to provide, huh? So we are, since we are talking about some form of uh, a asset allocation, yeah. And just now we talked about Alibaba, right? Yeah, which is uh, my brother, my brother's company, right? So maybe you want to use uh, Alibaba as an illustration, uh, as an illustration, huh? So I I'm going to skip the break, uh. so let's jump straight and then, you know, into the excitement. But before we go into uh, the Alibaba as a case study, so I think it would be good for me to uh, state up front, right, what is the BIA stand, yeah. And uh, this is a disclaimer notes, uh. so just pardon me in the next uh, couple of seconds, I'm just going to read this out. Uh. So just remember, we're going to share about this Alibaba, and the purpose of the case study, remember, is just to illustrate the application of value investing uh, methodology as well as uh, various valuation methods in the context of real-life uh, companies. And of course, uh, in our situation, right, we are talking in the circumstances uh, of the China clampdown. And remember, it is purely for the continual learning of value investing method, investors' education, and under no circumstances uh, does any information provided in these case studies represent a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any stocks, okay? So don't happy, happy, trigger happy, and then press buy, right? Now, the illustrations in the subsequent case study, which is Alibaba, demonstrate the general application of value investing principles or uh, investing principles and do not take into account uh, every single one of the individual characteristic profile or risk appetite of a given investor. So remember, in no event shall BIA, you know, Reina, like myself, uh, are liable to any viewers, guests, or third party for any damages of any kind arising out of the use of any content shared here, including without limitation the use of such content outside of its intended purpose of investor education and any investment losses, lost profit, lost opportunity. Oh, this is pretty long. Special, incidental, indirect, consequential, punitive damages resulting from such unintended use. So remember, neither my company, my Kinesis Investments, Private Limited, or VIA Value Investing Academy, nor the authors of the case study of Alibaba are operated or affiliated with any broker, dealer, or licensed financial advisor. So remember, Past performance is a poor indicator of future performance, which is why nobody can correctly predict short price in the short term, right? So again, the information on this presentation is not intended to be, nor does it constitute investment advice or recommendation. So remember, neither VIA uh, nor Reina uh, makes any representation or warranty as to the completeness or accuracy of the information in the case study. <sighs> Thanks for listening to my whole chunk of disclaimer. So right now, uh, I'm going to... Stop share. You can look at the screen right now. Alibaba Holdings. I'm going to stop share and I'm going to hand over to Reina. Reina, thank you. I'm going to stop. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kaden. Um, and so, without any further ado, let's just get into this. And uh, I will be uh, explaining and exploring the impact of the regulatory clampdown on our illustration, Alibaba Group Holding Limited. So, let's begin. So first, let me just give you a brief history about what is Alibaba. So Alibaba was founded in 1999 by 18 people, and one of whom was Jack Ma, 
he was a former English teacher from China. Alibaba.com was started as a business-to-business -business portal to connect Chinese manufacturers with international buyers. So today, it is one of the biggest companies in China, providing a range of platforms and services. It is the largest retail commerce business in the world in terms of GMV, which is gross merchandise value. It means the total value of the merchandise sold on a platform during a given period. It is commonly used to uh, evaluate e-commerce companies. Uh, over 50% of the market share in China is owned by Alibaba in terms of GMV. And Alibaba is a dual listed company. It is listed both in the US and Hong Kong. Uh, the annual active consumers of Alibaba reach approximately 1.18 billion people uh, for the 12 months ended June 30, 2021. And out of that, 77% are in China, which is represented by 912 million users as shown on the picture on the right. And the remaining 23% are international customers, which is 265 million people as shown on the chart on your right. Uh, Alibaba also has a 33% stake in Ant Group, which is the Jack Ma affiliated fintech company, which I was talking about earlier. Ant Group provides digital payment and financial services to consumers and merchants and other businesses. So now let me uh, uh, tell you about the regulatory actions which were taken against Alibaba. Uh, a $2.8 billion anti-monopoly fine was imposed on the company um, as I've already mentioned uh, in the earlier section. The fine was because Alibaba was forcing its merchants to uh, not advertise its wares on competing platforms. But the fine constituted only a minor portion of its revenue, that is 4% of its 2019 domestic sales. And the company expects that this was a one-time levy and it should not affect the company in the long term. Uh, now, as discussed earlier, the IPO of Ant Group was suspended by the authorities. And after the suspension, the company was subject to government oversight as well. Uh, it was required to restructure as a financial holding company so that banking regulations would be applied to it. And um, I'm sure you remember, as I explained earlier, this was uh, because Ant Group was uh, reaping the benefits of uh, the banking functions without the banking regulations being applied to it. So that was morally wrong. So as a result of all these steps, the Alibaba stock fell significantly and investors were quite nervous as we all know and we all are. So here are some of the major businesses in uh, Alibaba's ecosystem. Uh, I will explain them in the coming slides along with their business segments to which they belong. But basically, uh, Alibaba provides the infrastructure to companies to do business on its platform through the internet. Alibaba does not sell directly, uh, but it is a collection of several platforms. For example, on Alibaba.com, Wholesalers can find products from manufacturers. Suppose on this, on Taobao.com, uh, consumers can find products from small individual sellers and so on. Uh, Alibaba mainly derives its income through fees or commissions from its sellers for providing the infrastructure and platform and through listings, advertisements, marketing and facilitating transactions and other similar services. Now, um, let me give you a breakdown of all the businesses, the business segments in Alibaba's business. So Alibaba's businesses are comprised of four main segments. Uh, the first is the core commerce, which contributes 87% to its revenue. So this is the biggest uh, revenue generating sector uh, segment for Alibaba. And uh, next, the next biggest segment is the cloud computing, which contributes 8% uh, to the overall revenue of the company. And then we have digital media and entertainment, which constitutes 4%. And uh, next is innovation and initiatives, which, uh, which contributes 1% to the total revenue of Alibaba. In addition, we also have Ant Group, in which Alibaba has 33% stake, which provides digital payment services um, and financial services to customers. Now I will explain some of the key platforms in the Alibaba ecosystem. 
So, as explained earlier, core commerce is one of the biggest revenue generating se segments for Alibaba. So, it is comprised of China retail commerce and China wholesale commerce. And it is also comprised of cross border and global retail commerce and wholesale commerce. So, under China retail commerce, first we have Taobao Marketplace which is a consumer to consumer platform and it allows small businesses and individuals to sell their products on the platform. It has no transaction fees for its merchants. The merchants only have to pay for advertising and marketing to stand out from all the listed listings which are searched on their website. The next is Tmall. Uh, this is a business to consumer platform just like uh, eBay and Amazon. This platform is for buying products from brands and retailers. It is targeted at the middle income group of the economy. So as we discussed earlier, uh, the uh, goals of Alibaba are aligned with the CCP's uh, objectives of focusing on the masses. Alibaba has been constantly innovating new retail formats. So for example, we have Freshipo, uh, which is uh, also known as Hama in Chinese. It is their self-operated retail chain for fresh produce and it integrates online and offline operations and that's why this is called new retail format because it integrates the online and offline. Then Alibaba has also acquired a controlling stake in Sanat uh, which is a significant supermarket chain in China. The physical stores of Sanat are integrated with Alibaba, uh, uh, one of the platforms in Alibaba which is called Tao Shinda and Tmall supermarket platforms. This means faster deliveries, larger selections, and more efficiencies in operations. Then under uh, China Wholesale Commerce, we have 1688.com, which connects wholesale buyers and sellers in the Chinese domestic marketplace. Uh, then we have Ling Shaotong, which connects FMCG manufacturers and their distributors directly to small retailers in China by digitalization of the small retailers' operations. And this has majorly helped small retailers in, the re in remaining relevant in competition to the big box re uh, retail. And this is also another field where Alibaba is uh, helping in inclusion of the masses. Then we have cross-border and global retail commerce. So under this, we have Lazada which is the leading and fastest growing e-commerce platform which uh, primarily focuses on the Southeast Asian market. And then we have AliExpress. It enables global consumers to buy directly from manufacturers and distributors in China and around the world. Then we have Tmall Global, uh, which is for import commerce. Uh, it allows overseas brands and retailers to sell to consumers in China and it is the largest import e-commerce platform in China. Then under cross-border and global wholesale commerce, we have Alibaba.com. Alibaba.com is China's largest international wholesale marketplace platform. The sellers can list their products on this website free of charge up to 50 products. And there are also premium gold memberships which provide unlimited listing of products and verification from third parties. So also included under core, under core commerce is this segment called consumer services. Under this, we have Elema, which is a food delivery platform. Uh, so Elema literally translates in Chinese to, are you hungry? Then we have Kubi, which is a leading restaurant and local services guide platform. And then we have Fliggy, which is a uh, leading online travel platform under the Alibaba ecosystem. Next, uh, the next segment that I'm going to talk about is called digital media and entertainment. So under this, first we have Yuku. This is the third largest online video platform in China and it is quite similar to YouTube. Uh, then we have Lingji Games. Uh, in which uh, Alibaba develops, operates and distributes mobile games. Then we have Alibaba Pictures, uh, which is Alibaba's internet-driven integrated platform that covers content pr uh, production, promotion and distribution, and uh, cinema ticketing management and data services for the entertainment industry. So ma majorly this is for the entertainment industry. 
And then we have innovation initiatives. So under this, we have AMAP. It is a simple one-stop access point for services such as navigation, local services, and ride hailing. And then we have Ding Talk, which is a digital collaboration workplace. The next segment is logistics. So under logistics, Sinow Network offers domestic and international one-stop logistics services and supply chain management solutions. So the uh, advantages of this is that it provides real-time insights for merchants uh, to better manage their uh, inventory and warehousing. And for consumers, they can track their orders faster. And for courier companies, they can optimize their delivery routes. The next important segment is marketing. So under marketing, we have uh, Ali Mama, which is a monetizing platform. It matches the marketing demands of merchants, brands, and retailers in the ecosystem. And uh, last, we have Alibaba Cloud, which is in cloud computing. So Alibaba Group is China's largest provider of public cloud services. And the cloud computing business offers a complete suite of cloud services. Uh, for example, database, storage, big data analytics, machine learning, IoT, etc. And Alibaba is a significant leader in this industry. Uh, it has approximately 40% market share. And uh, it has first mover advantages in this industry. And this is a major growth potential for the company in the future. So basically, cloud industry is an industry with strong economies of scale and high switching costs. And China's cloud industry is very, uh, it's less mature than that of the US. And we already know Amazon is doing pretty well with their cloud business, which is Amazon Web Services. You must have heard about it. It's called AWS. So uh, Alibaba, uh, Alibaba's Ali Cloud is like AWS. And uh, since the market in China is still nascent, it has a huge potential going forward. And Alibaba has been investing significantly to grow scale. Um, the Ali Cloud revenue grew over 50% in 2020. So this is a key area of growth opportunity for the company going forward. And then just a small mention, they also have payment uh, services uh, in AND Group. Uh, so Alibaba has 33% stake in Ant Group, as I have mentioned earlier. And uh, Ant Financial owns Alipay, which is the largest digi digital wallet in China. So from all this, we can see that Alibaba is more than just an e-commerce company. And it is so crucial for the uh, economic growth of China. So next, um, I would like to talk about the revenue and performance of the latest quarter of Alibaba, which is June 21. The revenue for this quarter grew 34% year over year, which is uh, as compared to the same quarter last year. And then the net income and the EBITDA has fallen year over year. Uh, but And this is primarily because the company is investing in strategic areas to capture incremental opportunities, which will increase its addressable markets, and it will help it to better serve customers. The free cash flow of the company is also has also fallen uh, this quarter, which is by 43% year over year. And this was also mainly due to the uh, uh, decrease, uh, due to the investment of uh, excess profits in strategic areas, and also because the company utilized some cash to pay a partial fine on the uh, anti-monopoly fine, which was imposed on the company, as we have mentioned earlier. Uh, then this slide is uh, comparing the half-year revenues and metrics for uh, the company of, and of 2021, and it is compared to 2020. So the total column in this table shows the sum of Q1 and Q2 of each year. So we can see that the revenue for the first half year of 2021 has grown by 60% from the same period last year. And the gross profit has increased from 40, uh, by 41%. But uh, sadly, the net income, EBIT, and EBITDA have fallen 
uh, this uh, half year uh, and this is also probably because of the same reasons that they had to pay fines and they are uh, investing their excess profits in key strategic areas for future growth. So that is a good sign for the company. Uh, then uh, let me talk about the segment wise growth performance of the company. So as you can see in this red box here, the total commerce uh, division of the company grew by 35% year over year. Um, and this growth was due to the growth of online goods GMV, the consolidation of Sun Art um, and strong growth from direct sales. Um, including Tmall Supermarket and Hamas. So as you can see in others, this includes the Sun Art acquisition and the Sinau Logistics um, has also increased by 50%. So these two are the major contributors to the growth. The Sinau Networks Logistics grew by 50% primarily because of uh, increase in uh, order volumes uh, in the international commerce retail businesses. Then we can see in this next red box that the cloud computing sector of uh, Alibaba has grown by 29% year over year, but this, this growth rate was 59% last quarter. So uh, the reason for this fall is that Alibaba lost a major client last quarter uh, due to regulatory requirements and going forward the company has said that they expect more diversification in customers and industries. So that should reduce the concentration risk in this uh, segment of uh, Alibaba's business. The digital media uh, segment grew by 15% year on year. And uh, this was because of better content, improved quality of content in Ali Pictures and Yuku. That's it. And so now uh, let me talk about the uh, the pros, some of the good points that work in favor of Alibaba. The CCP's vision to redistribute wealth to the masses should boost the purchasing power of the people in the long run and that should boost the revenues of Alibaba. The Chinese e-commerce landscape is thriving. Alibaba will benefit from the growth of China's consumption economy which is benefited from the acceleration of digitalization in all aspects of life and work. And mostly the business fundamentals of the company seem to be largely intact because uh, the fine which was levied, all these were not related to the fundamentals of the company. And growing digitalization will also lead to growth in cloud business, uh, which is a very good growth potential for the company going forward. The company plans to invest all of its incremental profits back into business. It wants to put money into strategic areas, for example, Taobao deals, which is targeted at price conscious consumers and new retail, which will merge the online and off offline shopping experiences. So you see here again, they are uh, targeting the masses. So their goals are aligned with that of the CCP. The company, um, so these steps should uh, expand Alibaba's customer base into China's lower tier cities, less affluent shoppers, and it should drive engagement and frequency also. And ultimately, the share of wallet of Alibaba should increase. Some of the, uh, some of the uh, further positive points for Alibaba are that it is already well positioned in the e-commerce space and boosted by the reinvestment in business expansions, the GMV of the company should grow meaningfully, subject to the uncertain political and regulatory environment. That is always a disclaimer. And recently, Alibaba launched its first NFT marketplace platform that lets musicians and artists sell the rights to their content via blockchain uh, with the approval of the Sichuan government. So this means that they are innovating new ways to make money and expand. Uh, here is a short excerpt from the latest earnings call uh, for Alibaba. 
So let me just read it out. Uh, I will read out the highlighted portion. All the businesses we have invested are showing rapid growth. In the coming quarters, we will continue to invest additional capital into programs that support our merchants and developing new businesses in strategic growth areas that will help us increase consumer wallet share and penetrate into new addressable markets. Our strong profit and cash flow generation capability gives us the internal resources to focus on long-term value creation. Also, we are increasing our share repurchase program from $10 billion to $15 billion. This is the largest share repurchase program in the company's history because we are confident of our long-term growth prospects. So as you can see, this shows that they are investing for the long-term growth of the company and they are buying back shares. So this demonstrates the management's confidence also in the company's long-term value creation. Now I would like to in, uh, discuss about some key risks that Alibaba faces. Uh, Alibaba has pledged to end the anti-competitive practices in its company, so it may have to make certain investments or changes on its platform to keep its merchants satisfied. And this could hurt profitability in the short term. However, uh, as far as I see, all the players would have to make similar changes. And since many merchants are already on multiple platforms, but they are attracted to Alibaba because of its strong network effects, its traffic, because of its dominant effect, marketing effectiveness. So this should have limited impact on the company going forward. Another risk is that uh, they are facing increasing competition from companies such as JD.com, Pindodo, Tencent, and many others. Uh, one of the key risks for the cloud business is that the new regulatory regime for edtech companies will possibly curb their spending on internet services. This should affect the cloud business a little bit. And they have also lost a major client last quarter. However, the company hopes to diversify and grow the cloud business so that the concentration risk is minimized. Now, this is a very important point, uh, the risks of investing in a VIE. I don't know how many of you know that uh, if you invest in the US listed BABA stock, then you are investing in a variable interest entity. Now, um, when you, what is a VIE? So when you invest in a VIE, that is if you invest in the BABA stock, you are not getting an, any actual ownership into the real company. Now, let me explain how this works. Most Chinese companies are not allowed to have any foreign ownership. So to circumvent this law, if a Chinese company wants to get listed outside of China, it does, th it does so through a VIE. And under this structure, the company creates a shell company in the Cayman Islands, which is also named, let's say for our example, Alibaba. Then, Complex agreements are made to give this new company a claim to profits and control of assets in the old real company. There is no actual ownership. There is just an agreement. Then the new company is listed in the New York Stock Exchange. The VIA structure is actually illegal, but hundreds of Chinese companies have been listed like this for decades. And the Chinese government conveniently turns a blind eye because even uh, it wants foreign capital to enter. So with the unpredictability of the regulators in China, they may one day decide to enforce the laws. Um, and then the shareholders of the US listed VIE may be left with nothing. Now I'm not saying that it is very much likely to happen, but it is a very real risk and investors should be aware of this. And as, as evidenced by the recent crackdown, the political volatility of China is a key risk. And similarly, there may be uncertainties regarding the interpretation and enforcement of PRC laws and regulations, which we should keep in mind. Now, uh, let's move on to the valuation. 
most VIA graduates would be familiar with this model. Using the VIA target price calculator for Alibaba, we enter the past and present EPS here. So we enter the past EPS here and the present here. And so uh, we can see that the company has grown by 46% in 10 years. Assuming that the company grows for 10 years at a discount rate of 10% and an inflation rate of 2% with a 30% margin of safety, we get an adjusted growth rate of 18% for the target buy price to be 1097 CNY, which translates to $169. Investment in this stock is justified only if one has the conviction that this company can grow at 18% per annum or more. Now, please note that all investors should generally refer to additional valuations as a prudent step to take in the value investing methodology. Now, uh, I have used two other valuation methods, uh, taking conservative assumptions and 30% mar uh, margin of safety. The first method is uh, the perpetuity growth method. It is based on the free cash flow projections of the next five years. And the intrinsic value comes to the range of 172 to 198, as we can see, and the current market price is 173. The second method is uh, the EBITDA multiple method. Uh, this uh, method, uh, according to this method, our range comes to 192 to 223 US dollars. But as always, please note that all investors should generally refer to additional valuations as a prudent step to take in the value investing methodology. So to sum up, I would like to uh, close with some concluding thoughts. Uh, Alibaba dominates the e-commerce as well as the cloud computing space in China. It is in the growth mode uh, with its focus on reinvesting profits into strategic areas. Moreover, the share repurchase program also shows management confidence. The one-time fine had a short-term impact on the company and Alibaba is now going to stay within regulatory boundaries. As long as the company's goals are aligned with that of the CCP and uh, broad social objectives about uplifting the social and economic class of the masses, it should sustain its long-term growth trajectory. Companies like Alibaba are crucial for the overall economic growth of China and possibly the authorities would not want to cripple such a company permanently. With that, I would like to thank you all for your interest and attention this evening. Now, I would hand over to Kaden to continue with this presentation. Thank you. Okay, hi, Kaden is back. If you look at some of the valuation that Reina has used, uh, of course, if you look at the slide right now, the very first one is our discounted cash flow, which is, which is earning base. Yeah. So the intrinsic value goes up to a 169, which is over here. Yeah, after conversion of the ringgit 1097, right, to US dollars. So that's the first valuation method. And of course, the second one that Reina used is a perpetuity uh, growth method. She used assumption of five years. Uh, it's a bit complex, so we're not, so we will not go into the nitty gritty, but this is based on free cash flow. So I can really see one comment, Dennis. Dennis like all this technical stuff. Yeah, so he said that cool valuation methods mentioned. Never tried those before. Thanks for sharing. I'm quite sure that in uh, Dennis' future US case study, right, he, he will go and try this out. Then, uh, of course, we have the EBITDA uh, multiple method. Now, um, pu putting the, all the nitty-gritty aside, uh, at least you have some range. Uh. So maybe I can leave this thing here. If you want, you can take a screenshot, right, of this in the next five seconds, right? Yeah, oh, by the way, the YouTube video will be here. We're going to leave on this URL right permanently. You can always come back, look through the slides, take some screenshot or whatsoever. Huh? So we have one, which is 169. And then, so, so I think the range goes from 169, which is the lowest, right, to 223, which is the highest. Okay? 169 to 223. Right? So again, like what Reina I say, uh, every investor like you and me should generally refer to more valuation method as a prudent step to take into account the value investing methodology. And she has really shared her concluding thoughts, right? So mine is pretty fast, just one or two slides. Huh? Now, so the key thing is, 
uh, in case some of you are very cheeky, right? You may message me and say, okay, then did you press buy for Alibaba? Okay, so I, I think I better don't share about me because just not really say I'm not a license, right? By MS. But but let's talk about other people. So now the now the question is who owns Alibaba? I I think if you see Charlie Munger owning Rob, Alibaba, perhaps uh, you have higher confidence, right, than hearing Caden owning Alibaba. So let's look at here. If you look at Charlie Munger's 100% portfolio, right, it's 17.59% is Alibaba, okay? And if you look at here, when did he uh, bought Alibaba? He bought it in the first quarter as a new buy. Remember, it's not addition, it's a new buy, right? So the moment he pressed buy, right, pop, which, where the average share price is 245, uh, right now, it's a 166. Uh, I mean, as of a couple of days ago, and the uh, price drop has been about 32%. Yeah, so, you know, as value investor, we have to ask ourselves, uh, it, it, our time horizon has to be extremely long. Yeah, so right now, this is a, like a knee-jerk effect. So, Charlie Munger, again, is a famous value investor, the vice president of Berkshire Hathaway. So, he owns Alibaba. So, that's one famous value investor. So, let's look at the second one. Uh, the second famous value investor, right, is Monish uh, Pabrai. Monish Pabrai. If you look at his Alibaba stock, right, his top holding is 21%. It's almost the same, right? This is about 18 and this is about 20. So when did he start buying Alibaba? So he bought Alibaba in the first quarter. First quarter. And then he bought it in the second quarter. Yeah. So that takes up about uh, 20%. And then right now this is negative, huh? Negative, right? So uh, how should I say? Uh, I, I mean, if some of you are owning Alibaba and then you look at these two fella, Charlie Munger and Monish Pabrai, right? So I'm not very sure. Uh, do they give you some form of uh, consolation? Yeah, so when your price drop is 20-30%, uh, Charlie Munger is going through the same thing. Uh. So if, if they're not panicking, uh, uh, may maybe why should you? Uh, yeah, but, but provided you, you know what you're doing. Yeah, which brings me to my last slide. Actually, uh, I have nothing more. Eh? And when I look at the time, oh, it's just nice. No? We started at about 7.30, we finished at uh, 8.35. Oh, there's so much information and we actually uh, are ahead of time. So one hour and... Five minutes, we actually finish this presentation, which is fantastic, right? So I'm going to end my uh, uh, my presentation as well as Rena's presentation with a very uh, simple slide. Now, just to let you know that this is a screenshot of our channel called Value Investing Academy. And the URL, right, is uh, youtube.com slash valueinvestingacademy. So you realize that our subscribers uh, is very small. It's about 2,000 plus. You know, some people, they are like 300K and then 1 million and so on, right? Oh, so Man Manford say... Uh, I bought cheaper than them. So you feel better, huh? So, Manfred, does your ego get boosted? You, you bought cheaper than them. So, so you, you, you make that comment, you feel better, right? <laughs> okay, but joke aside. Yep, so this is our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com uh, slash Value Investing Academy. Now, just to let you know that if any one of you find that our presentation is interesting, right? Because we... Uh, maybe maybe let, let me start off with our original intention. Our original intention of doing this, right, for the very first time is to talk about the latest a hot topic or current issue that, that affect investors. And of course, of all the many issues that we, we have selected, a, the China uh, clampdown on edutech companies. Yeah, so uh, we, we thought that this was interesting. Yeah, then of course the next question is, if this is interesting, how should we do it? And at first we were thinking doing Facebook Live, but we had done it before. Then we were thinking we're doing a Zoom. We're doing a Zoom, nobody knows. So eventually, we want to try something new. So eventually, we end up uh, using uh, YouTube. YouTube uh. So these are very first time, right? So thanks for being patient with us. Uh, by the way, if any of our grads, right, uh, you find that this topic, uh, I mean, you find it interesting that we are going to talk about the hot topics, the current issues that are facing retail investors. Uh, and, and if you would like us right, to do it on a regular basis, Regular basis. Huh? Regular, we, we haven't figured out the schedule, so I better don't make a promise first. But, but if, you, if you would like us uh, to do some research on your behalf, uh, at, at least to kickstart, right, so that you know what is happening around the world that, that will affect us as investors. Uh, if you really find that this topic is, is interesting, right, if you don't mind, uh, if you don't mind, can you just help us write, uh, j just write the word more, more, not right. Can you just type in a comment more, right? That means you wanted more. Lah. You, you wanted more, huh? If you want us to do more interesting topic in our next uh, session, right, in which we will figure out when that will be, uh, in the YouTube comment session, can you just help to type more so that we know people are interested? Lah, huh? If nobody's interested, nobody type, but then we don't do it. So faster type. <laughs>
Great presentation, VIA. Always something new to learn. Good, huh? Ali, next time we ask you to come and present, okay? <laughs> we ask you to do Sheng Shang or something like that. Huh? Okay, faster. Quickly type. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Diraj. Huh? Diraj is watching this at Switzerland, you know. You know, Singapore is supposed to have a Switzerland lifestyle, right? But only one person has Switzerland lifestyle, which is Diraj. <laughs> because as of today, uh, the, the, the Singaporeans are having a Singaporean lifestyle, not Switzerland lifestyle. Well, wow, Ellie say more, 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 more. Oh, very good. Maybe there's a time lapse, ah. Huh? Time lapse, lag, right? Wow. So I, I see like maybe twenty more. Okay, very good. Uh, so so continue type more and then uh, do us a very small favor. Uh, two things, right? Number one, uh, at this YouTube video there should be a like button, correct? Huh? There should be a like. Don't mind, right? Before you you leave, uh, and then go for your wow. Oh, so many more. Okay, can you please help us to press like, huh? Press like, huh? So this first thing, don't mind, right? Help us to do, lah. Yeah, and then the second thing is there is a subscribe button, right? If you don't mind, just click on the subscribe button. Okay, so just click on like. Help us click on the subscribe button. And uh, before encore, yeah, yeah, I should ask you to type encore, huh? Why, why so lame? Right, put more, right? Yeah, encore. So before we end our session, uh, I would like to thank uh, Reina, and because Reina has spent really quite a number of days uh, doing research on this topic, right, which is quite refreshing, huh? Versus the usual case study that we do. So I like to thank. Reina, Reina is just sitting you know, on, the, on my left side. And I would also like to thank uh, Erfan, right? Erfan, quite poor thing. Uh. Uh, Erfan, one-man show. One-man show. Uh. Erfan is a DJ. He's trying to make, <laughs> do it the button. And then he's the, he's, he's the DJ, he's the videographer, because every time when I speak, and Reina speaks, he has to toss the, toss the <laughs> camera from left to right, right to left, and then he'll adjust the this and do that. Yeah, so I like to thank Erfan, and all this will not be possible Without Reina and Irfan. Of course, lastly, right, I would like to thank all of our graduates, which is 191 of you. Okay, good. Huh? So you like already, huh? Like already, huh? Okay, thanks for Desmond say what Swiss lifestyle. Huh? You, you must ask the uh, Diraj. Huh? <laughs> Diraj is in Switzerland, we all in Singapore. Okay, so I'm gonna head off now, right? Head off now, huh? So uh stay safe. Uh, me, myself, of course, together with Reina and Irfan, we'll we'll think of more things and and if we have some exciting topic, we are going to go through this process again. Okay? So, thank you all. Have a, a good evening, sweet James. And goodbye. See you soon. Goodbye. Thank you.